الحمد لله وشهر الله إله الله وحده لا شريك له وشهر على محمد عبده ورسوله الله صلى الله عليه وسلم محمد السلام عليكم first I wanna thank you for opening your doors to to come out to listen to what I have to say I just talked to a group of Muslims earlier so I hope that my repeating myself on some of these things you can bear with me. Um, I'd like to give you just a, a, a brief history about my life and then from there go into uh, some things I think that are important for me. Uh, again, my name is Mahmoud Abdul Uh I'm from Gulfport, Mississippi. And uh, I was born in a, in a single parent home uh, and I was born in conditions kind of like many in America and many throughout the world where I was surrounded with, you know, the prostitution, the drugs, low-income family. My mother had an eighth grade education, and because of that education, she wasn't able to provide us with the educational structure that we so needed. Uh, and because of that, early on in my life, uh, junior high school, I was labeled as slow in learning. And I'll get into some of that, inshallah, a little later. But in light of all of that, uh, the being on welfare and, and growing up without a father, and to this day, I don't know who my father is. Uh, the only thing that my mother ever told me was that he was a white guy. And she went to her grave. But I'm the only one of my brothers who don't know their father. Uh, my other two brothers know who their father is. And so I struggled with that as a young man. And in light of all of those things, you know, some people would say, well, um, you know, the, the chances of becoming successful may be slim growing up in an environment like that. Why? Because there's a tendency that when we grow up in, in situations like that and we see these things every day, we're around the prostitution, we're around the drugs, we're around the sex out of wedlock, you know, in teenage years, we see all these things daily, there's a, there's a tendency to just accept it. And, you know, we, we say, well, this is just, in so many ways, our fate, you know, living in these conditions. Not everyone, but some of us do. And so, uh, a lot of people at an early age counted me out, but I was blessed by Allah, and I didn't grow up as, as a Muslim. I grew up in a Christian background, uh, Baptist uh, background in the South. And, uh, I was blessed at a young age uh, to know what it was that I wanted to do. And for me, that was to become the greatest basketball player that I could possibly become. And basketball for me was a way out. It was, it was not something that I just wanted, but it was something I felt I needed. You know, I didn't know statistically, I didn't get the memo when I was young that I had a better chance statistically at becoming a doctor than a basketball player. I didn't know that, you know, because we see images of athletes and entertainers and so, oh man, the money and the fame. So, well, man, you know, I'm athletic, I'm, I'm kind of fast, I got a chance at this. So, uh, this is, I knew basketball was something that I wanted, so early on I charted out a course, I charted out a plan to say, you know what, at nine years old, so I need to figure out how to best reach this goal, how to best, best uh, become successful at this. So at the age of nine, I would wake up at four something in the morning and I would be out my door, I would wait to see my mother leave. She had to be to work at five. And when she would leave, I would leave and it would still be dark outside. And I had three courts in different directions that I would go to. And I would go to this court and on my way to the basketball court, and this is nine year old kid thinking like this. I'm thinking, man, I got to put the work, the weight of my family on my back. You know, I'm, I'm putting all this with this. This is the only chance I got. And it's sad that I thought this way. You know, but this is the way I thought. You know, I didn't, I didn't know all of these details. So I'm like, I'm putting, you know, I'm, I'm thinking that as this, I got to put the work, I got to put my, I got to get my mother and my brothers out of the ghetto. I got to get them out. And so I would wake up at four something in the morning. And when I see my mother leave, and she didn't know for years that I was doing this. When she would leave, I'm out the door and it's dark and I'm going down the court. 
I'm, I'm dribbling on my way to the basketball court, and I'm imagining I'm playing against an invisible person. And wherever I dribble, I'm imagining he's always this close, fingertips hitting the ball. Even when I'm shooting, this close. Because in my, in, in, in my thinking, I'm saying, you know what? The imagination is the strongest thing you have. If I can beat my imagination, if I can escape my imagination, human being can't stay with you like your imagination can. So this is the way I train. And this is, this is, and I would go to this court and I would train so hard that there were times literally I thought I was going to die. And I'm, I'm not, Allah is my witness. And this is an elementary student. You're doing this. And it didn't matter if it was hot outside. It didn't matter if it was cold. It didn't matter if it was, I would be getting dressed. And I'm not saying that you have to go to this extreme. But this is how bad I wanted it. This is how I saw myself. You know, I saw myself as... Basketball was something that I used, I thought defined me, made me who I was. You know, so I used basketball to get notoriety. I used basketball for a lot of things. Because again, I didn't think, I didn't see myself outside of being a basketball player. So I put all my marbles in that basket. And there were days when I would be getting dressed and you would hear the thunder. It would be dark. The sun, I mean the rain would be coming down. Torrential rain. And I'm talking about lightning. You hear it. And I'm walking out the door like the sun, the sun is shining. I'm oblivious to all of that. I'm unaware of all of that. All I can think about, I gotta make it. I just gotta make it. And, and I would do that year in and year out. I would come, I would go, come home sometimes, my hands would be frostbitten. Allah's my witness. Frostbitten. And I didn't know that you're not supposed to put hot water on cold hands. And I will come in and my, you know, I'm going to be dramatical. I'm trying, I really want you to get the picture. And I'm coming in the house and I'm turning on the faucet. And it feels like needles going through my hands. You know, and finally when I get warm and if we have anything to eat or whatever, I make me syrup sandwiches, sugar water, all of those things. I get warm, I'm back out the door again. I'm training. This is the way it was. There were times I literally, I would train so hard, <clears throat> I couldn't catch my breath. I thought I was, and tears would fall. I'm like, oh my goodness, a lot. I mean, I didn't say a lot at the time, but I'm taking this too serious. I need to slow down. You know, and this is how I would, I would constantly train. But Allah is great. Allah is the greatest because what's amazing about all of that, I used to come home. I used to take time out to come home and I would close my, close my uh, blinds. Curtains, we didn't have blinds. Curtains. We didn't have central air and heat, so I put a fan in the window. And I would close it and make it dark. And I would lay down. And I would, they use the word meditate nowadays. I would pray. I would think. I would dream. I would dream big. I would see myself in the NBA. I would see myself doing great things with basketball. And the more I dreamt it, the more it felt like I could touch it. But not only would I dream it, I would go out and I would try to implement it. And the more I did that, by the grace and mercy of Allah, it's like when you decide to do something, when you make a decision to do something, and you move in the direction of that decision, Allah begins to open up doors for you. And I remember in elementary school, I used to play against older guys all the time. I used to envision myself. Just, I mean, just, I would work hard and religiously. It got to the point where I was in elementary and we played a team, Westminster, and the score was 43 to 46. They won, but I had 42 of our 43 points. One game we lost 36 to 42. I had all 36. Wow. And then the word, you know, started getting out. Who is this? Who is this? Who is this guy? <laughs> right? And so this is a law, you know, and I started seeing the, 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 I started seeing the improvement. I started seeing the notoriety coming. And, and again, I'm going to be brief. As I began to play, I move on to junior high school. I'm in the seventh grade, playing for the ninth grade, starting all three years, putting up numbers. When I was in the seventh grade, I was playing for the 10th grade AU team, leading them in scoring 21 a game. But what's interesting is that even before that, when I was in elementary school, 
And I remember when I decided to do this, I'm gonna go backtrack just a little bit. There was a lady named Miss Cookie. She was an aggressive old lady. She always was looking for talent, trying to place you. <laughs> and I was playing on the playground, right on the school's campus. And right next door, literally I could throw a rock and hit it, there was a gym. And kids were in there trying out for elementary school. I didn't know it. I was, I was playing with my brothers, 21. Miss Cookie drove up. She said, at the time, my name was Chris. Chris, come in. I walked over. She said, yes, ma'am. She said, go in there and try out. I said, well, Miss Cookie, you have to ask my mother. Yeah. She said, don't worry about that. You just go in there and try out. She saw something in me. I went in there. I never played organized ball before. And I remember when I got out there on the court, I was dribbling through everybody. I mean, because I'm thinking, it's five on five, but I'm thinking game of 21. First one of 21. Coach had his stuff. He said, hey, son, uh, you're going to have to learn how to pass a little bit. <laughs> and my first game, I had 21 points. And that did it for me. Wow. And so I kept training. I kept training. So I go, through, I go through junior high. I get to high school. Before I even enter my high school career, uh, my high school years, I was already labeled as the first team All-State before I played one high school game. There's a lot, you know, okay, this is a lot of pressure. And I'm taking it all in. You know, I'm, 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 and, and I came from a Christian background, so I prayed all the time. Always praying to God, praying and trying to move in the direction of my prayers. Praying, trying to move in the direction of my prayers. Hoping that God will answer my prayers. And I began, they labeled me as the first team all state. I get into high school. Every, Allah is the greatest. Everything throughout my career that I dreamt. There's an old saying, I think, in psychology or whatever, that so as you think it, so shall it be. If you think it hard enough and you move in that direction, you know, it, it, it better chance of coming to coming life. Everything, 90% of what I thought about, it happened the way I thought about it. Because I, I, I put forth that effort, I kept God first. I kept all my first. And I, I continue when, when uh, that mental amnesia sometimes get me. What was I just saying? Put God first. Before that. All, all state. I'm going through high school, alhamdulillah, and my high school career, my first year in high school, I averaged 21, my second year, I averaged 32, my, my third year, my senior year, I averaged 28. We went to state back to back. I'm getting, I'm getting letters from all over the country, Georgetown, North Carolina, you name it. I don't think there's a school that I get a letter from. I go to Princeton, New Jersey, my, going into my 11th and 12th grade year. I get invited to Princeton, New Jersey. And I've been working out hard and praying. I'm in Princeton, New Jersey, the top 110, quote, of the best in the nation. This is my first time ever getting on a plane, never going out of state. I was nervous, didn't want to fly, don't like flying, but I said, hey, I've come too far to turn back now. I gotta do it. So I get on that flight, I go. There's a scout there. They said he's never given anyone a five, which was the highest score. Two years in a row, he gave, he gave me a five. And I was coming out of high school as the number one guard in the nation. One year, Jordan had happened to have been there. Michael Jordan was sitting in the bleachers. I'm on the bottom row. He begins to talk to us, explaining, talking to us about the NBA, what it's like how intense it is and all of that. He picks me out of the crowd, asks me to come on the court. He gives me the ball. He says, young fella, I want you to try to come at me real hard. Give me the best you got. I look at him. <laughs> I'm not scared. I'm looking at this, this is an opportunity because I've been working my behind off. This is my opportunity to see right now if my training is paying off, where I am, where I stand with who they say is the best. I'm in going either the 11 or going to the 12. I get the ball, I give him a, a, a jab, and I take left. I'm going, I'm, 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 I'm moving fast as my feet will let me, like my life depends on me. I can feel him, hear him breathing down my neck. 
I go up and I reach out to the goal. I can see his hand close. I flip it up, bam, score. The, the, the high school, the whole. And, and my insides are like, oh, oh my goodness, man. He gives it to me again. I'm like, I'm not going to do the same thing. So I get it. I'm in place. I go through my legs. I cross him over. I go to the right. Same thing. Laid it up. Ball comes out. Get it. He asks for the ball back. Asks him to go sit down. They're going crazy. I was going crazy. I was acting like, I mean, I was cool. If you saw me, the outside of me looked cool. I was acting like I do it all the time. But inside, oh my goodness, man. I just scored on Jordan twice. And it was easy. Wait till I go home and tell my boys about this. Right? I mean, I was excited. But what that did for me, it didn't, sometimes things like that happen, we get relaxed. We feel I'm already there. I told you, can't tell me nothing. That just, that made me want to work harder. Because I wanted that feeling all the time. I wanted to be, get that feeling all the time. And so, I go through college, getting all of these things. I, I mean, I go through high school. I go to LSU. My first year in LSU, I remember the journalist, he asked me, he says, uh, what do you want your career to say for itself when it's over? I was, man, I was so serious. You know, I'm coming from a small town in Mississippi. I'm in college now. I'm going to be playing against guys 6'5", 6'6", 6'4", they're stronger, faster, all of that. Jump higher. I looked at him, I said, man, I didn't say man, I said, if I could average 13 points and seven assists a game for my career at LSU, I think that would be decent. My first game at LSU, I had about 12, 13, and seven. I said, okay. I met the first game standards. Second game, I had 21. I noticed something though. Man, I said, <clears throat> I said, I have 21 points. And I'm thinking this to myself, I'm like, man, I'm doing the same moves I've been doing since elementary school. I ain't had to change nothing. And they're working. Same old moves. Dale Brown stops me at the door coming in. We lost that game. He says, uh, we're going to need you to score more. I said, coach, I'll try. My third game, I'm a freshman. I have 48. Fourth game, 36. Fifth game, national television, number one team, Florida. In Florida, I scored 53. I'm, I'm nervous, I'm shaking. I'm on the bus, looking out the window, crying like a baby. I mean, crying. I'm like, man, this, this ain't supposed to be happening. This is too good to be true. I ain't supposed to be doing this right now. I'm thinking to myself, man, man, I'm gonna get hit by a truck, plane gonna crash. I know something getting ready to happen to me because this ain't supposed to be happening. We get on the plane, it's raining and thundering and lightning. Normally the plane does this. The plane is doing this, it's moving like this, lightning. I say, I knew it! <laughs> I knew it. And when we land, we finally landed. I'm getting off the I'm getting off the plane. I'm literally contemplating this time. I'm like, man. I was thinking about going to tell a coach. I said, Coach, listen, I want to play, but I don't want to fly. <laughs> I just want to play home games. <laughs> but you know, I had to suck it up. I said, you know what, hey, man? If I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die. Yeah, but we all gonna die. So let me go ahead. I come too far to stop. So my career, still to this day, by the grace and mercy of Allah, and Allah is the greatest. Because I say that, and I'm gonna go back. That when you make a decision to do something, you know how I say, when you take a step, Allah takes many more towards you, right? Makes your path easy. My, uh, everything pretty much I dreamt of came true. The same numbers that I put up in high school, 32 and 28, 11 and 12 grade year, I mimicked. I mimicked. My first and second year at LSU. In high school, they had they was asking for autographs. They had to bring security guards sometimes to take me to the bus 
Same thing that was happening at LSU. I still hold, right now, it's been 25 years, by the grace and mercy of Allah, I still hold the single, uh, the, the NCAA freshman scoring record throughout the nation. Nobody has broken. The only person that has come close two, three points is Kevin Durant, who's in the league. <laughs> it still stands. When you make a decision, Allah makes it easy. Okay. In LSU, Dale Brown gives me <laughs> out of the blue. You know, I talked about my education, not having an educational structure. There was a lot of things I didn't know. You know, I'm in Mississippi and I didn't know anything about the Prince of Slaves, Abdul Rahman, coming out of Timbuktu, you know, and, and, and the powerful civilization, Islamic civilization that Timbuktu had. They didn't teach us that. And even though he was right up the street in Natchez. He was enslaved in Natchez, Mississippi, two and a half hours, three hours away from me. We didn't know that. You know, so, you know, there's a lot of things, uh, I didn't, I, 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 uh, what was I going to say? Uh, educational structure, educational structure. Where was I, where were I going? Where was I going? Uh, uh, <coughs> a lot of things I didn't know. I was talking about Abdul Rahman. Uh, uh, oh, shut up. It mental amnesia go again. It's been a long day, brothers. Excuse me. Uh, Dale Brown, alhamdulillah, Dale Brown at LSU gives me the autobiography of Malcolm X. And you know, I'm, it's sad for me to say, up until college, I never heard of Malcolm X until I got the book. That's a shame. I get the book, <coughs> I'm reading it. Like, man, you know, his life is fascinating. I'm looking at how he transformed his life, became the person he became. I go to my, I, I get drafted to the NBA. I've, I've all, I've, for a long time I've been searching. I had questions about Christianity, you know, and when I would ask questions, I would always get two of the most universal answers. I always, I mean, I hear. Can't question God, just gotta believe. That was unsatisfactory to me. I'm like, look man, I, I think God wants us to question if we're questioning with the intent to know. You know what I mean? I, I really think that. But nobody could give me that. So as 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 I got to the NBA, I befriended this pastor because I was still searching. I was putting crosses in my, my shorts, crosses on my shoes. I was professing to be a Christian, but really wasn't practicing because my mind was all over the place. I knew there was something else. I knew. And I all oh, please God, guide me, guide me to this truth. Don't leave me stranded. You know what I mean? So I met this person and he had a protege at the time named Mark James from New York and one day Mark James and I we were sitting in, the, in my home in Denver during my, during my first year and the word Islam came up I said you interested in Islam? he said yeah he said you? I said yeah he said he worked at the airport he said brother I met a Muslim brother in the airport named Abdullah he said we can go to the masjid on Evans Street and pick up a Quran Got in the car, sped on down. Saw the brother, he was tending to the guard. I said, brother, we were, we were told that we can come here and get a Quran from him. He said, sure. Very, very hospitable. Took us down in the masjid, gave us a Quran, talked to us for a little bit. I wasn't really listening because my, my thing, I want to know what's in this book. <laughs> you know, I was ready to go home. I sped back home and I remember I got to the table. He, he had his, I had mine. And I got to the table, I was so excited. <laughs> I opened it up. I can't remember which pages I read. But I remember opening up, I'm reading the page. I read two or three pages. I look up at Mark and I said, man, I don't know about you, but I'm gonna be a Muslim. It's a done deal for me, it's, it's it. I ended up going to the masjid, talking to this brother who was a janitor. On and off, he would tell me about different concepts and all of that. And after my first year in the NBA, after this little rookie review uh, that we had to go to, we were encouraged to go to as rookies in Utah. When I came back, I went to the master and I embraced his land. Alhamdulillah. And it's the best thing that has ever, I mean, no amount of fame, no amount of uh, wealth, family, children, none of that, none of that compares to the gift 
that Allah has given me through this deen because it puts everything in perspective. Everything. And and when I became a Muslim, some interesting happened. <clears throat> People started playing playing games. You know, they were looking to see, oh, I want to see if he really gonna practice this thing. He just say he's a Muslim. And so I began to pray, I began to read, I began to debate. You know, I said, oh, he's serious. <laughs> you know, they began to question sometimes when I fast. They will try to discourage me from fasting. Look, look, man, this, this is between me and Allah. You don't have to like it, but this is what I'm going to do. They would be mad at the fact that I'm fasting. You're losing too much weight. But then that year, I got the most improved in the NBA. <laughs> then at the same time, they began to, on CNN, because Hakeem Olajuwon at one time, he was not fast, he wouldn't fast during game days. And one day we were driving after the game in Denver. We were talking, I said, well, brother, I gotta go get something to eat. <laughs> I've been eating, he said, huh? I said, yeah, I was fasting today. <laughs> I gotta eat. He said, you, you fast? I said, yeah, that's all I know. You know that's, that's what I was told, that's what I do. He said, and don't. I said, man, when I fast, I don't, I don't know about you. When I fast, I feel more focused. I, I'm more energetic. I feel great. He's like, well, if you do it, I'm going to do it. So he started fasting. And one year, CNN, they didn't know they were doing this. They were giving dollars, didn't even know it. But they reported that the Muslims, in particular, Mahmoud and, and Hakeem, their stats went up during Ramadan. But before they was tripping, about why you you don't need to do that, you're gonna lose a lot of weight. After that, they have no problem. They were looking forward to Ramadan. <laughs> I can't wait to see you, man. I can't wait to Ramadan come. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, but but alhamdulillah, you know, these you know, but they would play games. You know, you're trying to fast, I mean you're trying to pray before games, you're trying to pray after the games, they set rooms up for you, trying to rush you. If you're losing games, uh, because I would come in a lot of times, I would pray, then I would come in and catch up. And then wherever he was, I'd follow the game plan. But it got to the point sometimes when we would lose, they would come and say, yeah, we got people, they coming in late. You know, but they were referring to me because I was fast. I mean, I was, I was praying and stuff. But they would play these games. But I'm going to move a little further because, you know, as a Muslim, it's possible, especially for you young people, it's possible, very possible. Islam is so flexible. Islam is so inclusive that you can be a basketball player, you can be a baseball player, and still be at the highest level of your Islam. You never have to compromise that. And the more that you stick to your guns, people gonna try you. It's like Allah says, never will they be satisfied with you until they cause you to denounce your deen, right? But he says, hold fast to that rope of Allah, right? There's success in that. They want to try you. Everybody does, but the more they see you sticking to your guns, believe me, they're going to leave you alone. And that's what usually happens. They just, man, nah, that's my move. He gonna, you might as well get up and up. <laughs> he going to do what he's going to do. Just leave him alone. As long as he's coming to work and doing what he is, leave him alone. So, you know, it's, it's, it's possible as a Muslim, don't, don't ever compromise what you believe in. Yeah, you know, struggle, look, struggle, we talked about it earlier. You know, I was talking to this lady at LA Fitness, and she said, you still practice? I said, of course. She said, well, I don't follow religion. I said, why? She said, well, religion comes from man, and man is flawed. I said, well, we don't really believe, we believe that Allah created man in the best of disposition, the best of molds. We don't think he came out flawed. But we, I, I do believe that Allah placed us in a world where flaws exist. Because without flaws, we couldn't elevate ourselves. If everybody was perfect, if everybody could play basketball, what need would there be to train? <laughs> right? Without hurt, or without hurt, you wouldn't know ease. Without wrong, you wouldn't know right. So we, you know, through, through flaws, you, you, you can elevate. So struggle, it's like, if I took, we talked about earlier, if I took a piece of iron, and, we want to make a tool out of that iron. What do I have to do to it? I have to take that iron and put it through severe heat. I have to bang on it and bend it 
in order to mold and shape it into a beautiful tool. Well, that's what struggles do for us, right? We go through, Allah gives us these struggles in order to what mold and shape us and frame us so that it can make us beautiful if we look at it that way. So you know what I mean? But, but as, as I began to read more, you know, the challenges are going to keep coming. And you know, as Muslims, we got to welcome them. So hold on, what, what are you trying to tell me through this challenge? What am I supposed to get through? I know you're not going to give me, send on me a burden I can't bear. I know this is meant to make me stronger. Let me, let me receive that out of it. What happens later is what ends my career, in a sense. Because I, be, I began to develop a conscience. Again, I said earlier, I grew up without the educational structure that many people need. So there's a lot of things that I felt they cheated me on. Because when I got older, I started reading. I'm like, hold on, man, why? Why didn't you teach me this? Why did I come across this? This is right in front of my Why don't I know this? And I started to be insulted and cheated. Right? So now everything I got and I read, I'm like, I'm trying to, I'm trying to read everything. I'm trying to discuss it, right? I don't care no more. You know, you, you made me mad now. I felt that you cheated me. So I began to read. I began to develop more of a conscience. So one day I stopped. I just, I'm looking at the flag. <laughs> you know, I'm looking at this symbol. And I'm reading about America throughout the world and its involvement in a lot of places. Right? You know, raping resources, killing folks. And I'm looking at this symbol and it's a representation of this. This is me. I, you you got to make your decision. But I'm talking about what I was going through. And I just couldn't see it. I said, I can't, I, I can't do it. So what I began to do for about three, four, five months, I began to, I began to, when they would, the national anthem would come on, I would act like I was stretching, getting ready for the game, because I didn't want to be so obvious, because I'm still trying to figure this thing out. What do I do? Stand, sit, stand, sit. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm warming up. Some days it's, it's on. I'm looking around like I'm looking for somebody. I ain't want to be at attention. All <laughs> right. I didn't, I didn't want to be a part of that. So one day the general manager comes, the assistant general manager comes and says, Mahmoud, he says, some, there was a guy who's been noticing uh, for some time that you haven't been standing. He said, uh, he would like to talk to you. Would you like to talk to him? This is common, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, it's common knowledge. We talk about it all the time on the street level, boom, boom, boom. So I ain't, I ain't seen nothing of it. So I said, well, sure, I'll, I'll talk to him. After that interview, the next day in practice, <laughs> After practice, floods of uh, tail camels, camels was just there. And I'm sitting here and uh, they're asking me questions. So what do you think about the American flag? Blah, 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 blah. And I give them my answer. They highlight tyranny and oppression. That's the only thing they say. They don't deal with the whole comment, which was a balanced comment. I said, look, it represents tyranny and oppression. But am I saying everything in America is bad? No, there's good that exists. But wherever the bad is, even if it's in Saudi Arabia, as a Muslim, we don't stand for it. That's a balanced statement. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? But they, tyranny oppression, tyranny oppression. Try to assassinate my character. I got two ulcers because of that, because I was holding back. I wanted to say something, I wanted to, I wanted to charge. But I, you know, I was just holding back. I got two ulcers because of that, just listening to that. I was getting calls from Larry King and people, want to come on. And I was contemplating. I just wanted to tell my side of it. Right? And uh, there's a brother that I talked to uh, <coughs> named Muhammad Alasi in DC, uh, Myron Derry. And I wouldn't have came back if it wasn't for that brother. And my coming back was in no way a compromise whatsoever. But he told me, he said, he said, it's your decision. He said, either way it goes, alhamdulillah, you're not wrong. You can stick to it, or you can choose another course. And this course won't be compromising. But in actuality, maybe it'll give you the upper hand so that you can still be in that position, in that NBA, and hopefully, inshallah, be able to still be an impact in that, in that environment. He said, once the prophets were signed, and some companions were sitting, 
and a Jewish funeral procession was passing by. And the prophet stood up. And some of the Muslims said, Prophet, what are you doing? Stand up. He said, man, we fight against these people. They kill us, we kill them. What are you standing for? He says, I'm not standing for their cause. I'm standing because Allah gave a life and Allah took a life away. He said, so you could stand while the anthem is being played but not for their cause and make a dua for those who are dispossessed, who are oppressed, you know, so on and so forth. And I ain't gonna lie, I was so mad when he told me that. <laughs> you know, because I like to, if something makes sense, I, I, I would hope that it you know, appeals to me and I follow it. But I didn't want to hear that at the time, because it made sense. Mm. I want to go and man, I want to go Tell somebody something. And I thought about it and I had to suck up my pride. And I said, you know what? I'm going to take that. And I knew after that they were going to say it's a compromise, it's a compromise. And they would come, well, I see you compromise, huh? After they find you 30 something thousand, I said, they never find me. That's what they told you. They never took anything out my check. I said, furthermore, I never compromise on my belief in Shabbat. I said, I'll do the same thing again. And this is what I told them. But these type of things, when I made that stand, it's like, it's okay to be a Muslim and play basketball, but it's not okay to be a conscientious Muslim to voice your concern about a socio-political or economic situation because they don't want this type of behavior to catch on. So they have to make an example of it. They ended up trading me that year, right? And this is right after we beat uh, Seattle. We were the first eight seed, two years in a row to beat the first seed, two years in a row. We were, we were wrong. We, we were getting better each year. They broke us up because of that. Uh, so I go to Sacramento. I have a history. They started to slowly just erase me from the, from the books. I go to Sacramento. I knew it. Some told me I should have and walked away. Because I knew that once I went somewhere else, my minutes were going to decline. Because they, they can't do it gradually because it's too obvious. So my minutes began to decline. I got less minutes. First time in my career, I got DNP. Did not play because of coach's decision. I got a lot of lows. Like, wow. To the point to where Houston Rockets' Tom Janovich came. Sacramento. And uh, someone was in the locker room, and they came back and told me, they said, man, Tom, Don Tom Jonovich was, like, tripping. He was like, man, why are they playing this guy? He said, when we come to Sacramento, we organize our defense around him to guard him. Why are they playing him? They did a report on television that uh, the best free throw shooters in the history of the game, I was number one in the league. Number one in the league. They not once showed me on TV. I said, oh, it's just too obvious now. Usually when I didn't play, reporters would come in the locker room. So why aren't they playing? Boom, boom, boom. The whole year, I didn't have a handful of reporters ask me anything. It was like I was hands off to the media. I said, wow, this is interesting. And so after that, after those years were up, I just said, you know what, I'm done. I'm not, I'm going to just leave it alone or go to season play. So I went to Turkey a little bit. Didn't stay long, had my first child, said, you know, I'm done, I'm, I'm tired of the politics, so I'm going home. You know, I came back home, spent about a couple of years. I got a call back, what's the name of that team? Vancouver Grizzlies. I don't know why. Allah allowed me to sneak back in the door. He was sleeping. Allah put him to sleep enough for me to sign the contract. <laughs> and I got there, and the first year was guaranteed, second year was uh, their option. I told him, I said, I'm not going to come back unless you can give me your word that if I get in the shape I'm supposed to get in, that I'm going to get some time. I ended up getting into some shape. They wanted to put me on the injured list. I wasn't injured. I was offended. Dick Versace had a 40-something uh, uh, minute meeting with him. He was trying to convince me to go. I said, no. I said, you're not a man of your word. I said, you told me that if I got into the shape that I was supposed to get in, that I was going to play. And I told you this is why I was coming. Because I've been in this situation before, and I didn't want to be in it again. And, and I said, so I said, you're not a man of your word. I said, I've done everything underneath the sun. I said, even your coaches and players are coming back and telling you, my mood is dominating practice. I was number one in the league at that time. 
of number one of points per minute. When I get in the game, I average a point per minute. But I can't play. You're not playing. <clears throat> right? So that, that rubbed him the wrong way. Okay, that summer, but it really killed it. Now I'm, I'm towards the end. 9-11. Happens. Bernard Goldberg. They want to do an interview. And they call you and prep you first. They call somebody else call you and they prep you to see if the interview is worth having. They ask you all these questions. Then they'll call back and say, hey, yeah, I think you want to have an interview with him. Yeah, I think it'll be good. So he comes down to Mississippi. And I see on his face, Jewish guy. And I see on his face, and I say, he has an agenda. So, huh. And at that time, I ain't feel like playing. I ain't feel like being diplomatic. So you know what, man, if you ask, whatever you ask me, I'm just going to give it to you and chips is going to be like that. And I'm going to tell you why I feel that way now. I felt I've been cheated. I've been lied to throughout my educational process. And I'm at the point in my life now that it's like I told him. I said, my, I'm going to live and die with a free conscience whether you or anybody else like it or not. If that's something I want to say, it might not come out the right way. But I'm not holding back anymore. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not always right. But if it's something I feel deep in my heart, so I can't sleep. If it's something on my chest, because I feel like a coward. If I don't say it, I feel like a coward. I don't want to feel like a coward. I don't want to feel like a slave. I don't feel like that. I had, <clears throat> I had to begin to break those chains early because when I grew up in Mississippi, I would see my mother and my parents. You know, because racism exists everywhere. And I would see my mothers and my parents when they were confronted with white people. They would put their head down and be submissive, but behind closed doors, that's such, 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 talk like crazy. And I would see this for years. And then I found myself, when I had to confront people, it's like, why am I feeling nervous? Why do I feel this way? I don't like to feel this. This ain't natural. So I had to say, you know, I got to break these chains. I don't want to ever be like this. You should be able to say what you want to say, and, and that's it, and be comfortable with that. So I began to do that with Bernie Bickerstaff, the general manager, and my, my, my agent at the time. He was, uh, he used to have, uh, he used to uh, be in these meetings, and he would, uh, he would always refer to me as his son. And he would talk about his son more than me while he was negotiating my contract. So I had a meeting with him, I said, I just gotta do it. I gotta get, I, I gotta, I gotta get stronger. And so I went in, I had a meeting with him. I said, Mr. Miller, I need to talk to you about something. He said, yes, son. I said, that's the first thing. I said, I'm not your son. I said, my mother's the only one that raised me. She was my mother and my father. If anybody got a right to call me son, it's my mother. From now on, it's first name basis for you. And I'm looking right in his face. First name basis. I said, another thing, we go in these meetings. I said, you talk about your son more than me. You work for me. I don't work for you. <laughs> he looks at me. Who are you? I just felt I had to do that. You know, so this is why now I feel. So people don't understand when they see, oh, he's not standing for the flag. When they see this guy saying what he's saying, they don't know the genesis. They don't know where it's coming from. This is not a guy trying to be a scholar. This is not a guy trying to be recognized as being, oh, he stands up for issues. No, I'm teed off. If I got something, I'm not going to hold back no more. If I, if I got to die, I got to die. If I'm going to lose a job, I'm going to lose a job. My wife used to say, oh my goodness. She said, every time somebody want to interview me, <laughs> she said, baby, what you, what you going to say? <laughs> I said, she said, every time you give an interview, somebody burn down a house, we don't get no job. <laughs> I say, sweetheart, I understand. I say, and I apologize. I say, God knows I apologize. I said, but this is who you married. And I said, right now, I can't turn back. I said, I got, I just can't. I said, I'm sorry for any, 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 any trouble I put you through. I'm sorry. But this is who you married. And I just, I got to do it. Because I won't feel right if I don't. You know, so, uh, this HBO interview, he came in. And usually when people come in, first thing, and I'm going to end it with this. The first thing that people do when they uh, interview you, they try to warm you up. So how's everything going? Blah, 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 blah. Man, he came in. We're in the master. He sits down in front of me. He says, so, 
Think Bin Laden did it? <laughs> I chuckled. And man, I start, I start just, they, they butchered it. If you ever go back and look at it, it's totally butchered. You know, my, my, my answer at the time was no. But if he did do it, he, he wasn't alone. And I said, there's a lot of questions that hasn't been answered. You know, that needs to be addressed. And I started giving, you know, all these things. There was Jews on the other side of Manhattan on the, on the filming the incident. They were reporting back to Israel for being a part of the Mossad. I said, why don't you tell the public that? I said, there were $10 billion traded on the two same airlines. Why don't you tell the people? I mean, I was going, I was just, I was giving it to them as best I could. And he was looking, where you get this information from? <laughs> and he wanted me to say, well, I was getting them from Crescent or Muslim Publications. Well, I'm smarter than that. I said, well, I'm getting them from the Spotlight. I'm getting them from uh, uh, Washington Report on Middle Eastern Affairs. He hesitated. <laughs> he stopped about two, three times in the interview, walked outside, talked to this guy, cursing him out. Because this is the guy that was calling him saying, yeah, this interview is worth having. This is what he says. But I was giving him some extra stuff that I ain't tell his father. He wasn't ready for it. And, uh, but you know, after that interview, they were supposed to hire me back, being the fact that I was number one in the league in points per minute. After that interview, I couldn't even get a trial with the NBA team. Nobody even wanted to see me come in the door. Coangelo, even after the flag incident, Coangelo still in the NBA, Coangelo, my agent called him, say, hey, man, my boots on. He's trying to talk. He cut him off. Not interested. And it has nothing to do with basketball either. That's what he said. <laughs> he's, it has nothing to do with his skill. Just prejudice. I was in California trying out, trying to get back into the, to the fray of it uh, and playing. Somebody from the Clippers came. Say, hey, man, we're looking for a guard. Okay, I'm going to lie. I love to, I love to play for you. Elder Baylor want to talk to you. It's okay. Meet us here tomorrow. It's okay. Fine. I come in the gym. I'm looking at Elgin Baylor from a distance. I'm in the stands. He's looking. He's with a couple of his guys. He looks back. He's looking. All of a sudden, the guy comes and talks to me. He said, "My move, man. I really apologize." I said, "What you apologizing for?" He said, "Elgin Baylor don't want to talk to you on account of what you said on HBO." <laughs> I said, "Man, it's cool." I said, I appreciate you coming over here and telling me. But I lost all respect for individuals like that because of the fact that you should know how much the media distort the news. You, you called me here. You couldn't come to me like a man and tell me yourself. You don't even want to know my side. Right? <laughs> you know, and you just want to do that? So I lost all respect. But my, what I'm trying to say is this, out of all of what I just said, that no matter what we go through in life, Allah is our result. He's the best to provide. Stick to your principles. Stick to your guns. I lost millions of dollars. Somebody burned down my house, Mississippi. But that's not going to deter me. Inshallah, I'm going to live and die as a Muslim whether you like it or not. Period. And, 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 and that in and of itself Right is is the greatest gift, the greatest accomplishment. You know, the, the, the those who came before us struggle way more than we struggle. Right, and so as Muslims, as committed Muslims, man, your 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 possibilities are great. No matter what you go through, these tests and these struggles are meant to make you stronger. I promise you, they are. Just believe in Allah and believe that that's the case. And just, and just evaluate your values. Evaluate them. When you evaluate them and you realize this is what I value. Once you really evaluate them, say, if justice is what you value, because if it's truly what you value, you're going to want to make it a part of your character, your personality. And you're not going to let anyone deter you from it. You're going to feel you need it. I need this to make me whole. You know, and stick to that. You know, there's a George Washington Carver said something, and I'm going to end with this. He said, and I, I keep it in my kitchen. It's Islamic, even though he may not have been a Muslim. He said, no one has the right to come into this world, then go out of it 
without leaving behind distinct and legitimate reasons for having passed through. We all have been given something by Allah. The, the possibility of greatness. And like Allah says, well, I'll you know, talking about that thing called time. You had a loss except for a certain amount, a certain, certain group of people, right? We have to take advantage of every second. We should be thinking about what type of legacy do I want to leave? Because I don't have a right to come into this world with a, with a loss given me and go out of it without leaving behind distinct and legitimate reasons for having passed through it. So think about that. Every day, you know, what it is that you want to leave as your legacy. You know what I mean? You want to be a slave to Allah or a slave to this dunya? Assalamu alaikum.